So hello and thanks for joining us here at the BAFTA Games Masterclass. My name's Adele Cutting, I'll be hosting this evening. I'm an audio director and run the games out audio outsourcing company Soundcuts. Today I'll be talking to the amazingly talented and multi-award winning Gareth Coker on the art of storytelling through music. But first of all, we'd like to thank the BAFTA Games official partners who are Activision Blizzard, EA, Playfusion, Tencent, Ubisoft and Sega for their support in us being able to put on events like this around the UK. So BAFTA pr produces a number of games events around the year. These include both public and private member events. For more details on joining BAFTA as a full member or any of the other BAFTA initiatives, please visit BAFTA.org. So now, without further ado, Mr. Gareth Coker. So thank you very much for coming this evening. Thank you. Uh, obviously, everybody wants to talk about Ori because it was such a roaring success. I guess. So, <laughs> so I'll start off by asking you, how did you and Moon Studios get in contact with each other in the first place? A random email back in the depths of time, what appears to be now <laughs> the depths of time. Uh, so I was uh, a member of a website called moddb.com. And uh, I had a profile there, and I was scoring some, uh, some really small projects. And uh, randomly, the director of Ori, Thomas Mahler, he found me on the website, um, found a couple of pieces of music that uh, he'd liked of mine. And he just contacted me out of the blue, said, I have a prototype that I think is really cool, and I would be interested in having you write some music for it. Um, if you do the prototype, and I like the music, and we're picked up by a publisher, you can score the rest of the game. And uh, about five to six months later, Microsoft picked up the game and the rest is history. Was there a specific track that they liked on uh, Yes, there was. It was from uh, a really obscure student film that I did um, uh, at the University of Southern California. Uh, but the student, that student film in question was set in a forest. And I think that was kind of what, uh, what got the, uh, the juices rolling with them. Cool. Do you want to play I, a little I snippet? I will. I'm going to have to go over here quickly. <laughs> Uh-oh, now I can't find the folder. And that's literally it. Awesome. <laughs> Just 50 seconds of music <laughs> is basically what got me the Ori gig. Um, Brilliant. So it doesn't always work out like that. <laughs> <laughs> so when they first got in contact with you, did they tell you um, much about the storyline? When you did, how much of the storyline did you know before you wrote your pitch? I um, well, I did know. The, actually, no, I didn't know the story. All I got given for the for the pitch uh, was four different playable levels. Um, and they just said, we need, we need gameplay music um, for these four different environments. So what they, what they were trying to show in the pitch was a range of colors and environments and diversity in sound and in visuals. The gameplay was a, a typical platformer with some of the unique abilities that you, that you have in Ori. But um, in terms of the story, it, Thomas, the director, had it in his head. But he, I, I don't think he wanted to reveal it to anyone in case it got you know, nicked or something, but yeah. uh, um, he, uh, he, he never told me the story um, while we were doing the prototype. It was just, uh, it was only until we got the pitch that I actually knew the plot for the game. Okay, because uh, I've read quite a lot about the fact that they were heavily inspired by the Lion King and the Iron Giants. Yes. So were you told about that? Uh, he did, 
what what uh, what Thomas uh, likes, he gives us uh, lots of lists of things to to watch and uh, and consume. Uh, he ba ba basically any Disney film where a cuddly character dies is is <laughs> something that we were encouraged to watch. So yes, Lion King, uh, Bambi, um, you know, Iron Giant was. Uh, what what the Disney films are very good at is uh, is making, bringing out really, really deep emotions in something, in, in visuals that are actually quite simple to look at. Making you cry. Yes, yes. <laughs> uh, so you won the pitch. Yes. You started work on it. Uh, how much information did they give you? So you knew, uh, you, you were told the storyline at this point. Yep. Um, but did they give you any ideas in terms of a music brief, direction, number of cues? How, how much was left to you and how much was dictated? This was probably one of the, the best things about working on the project. I had total, despite my complete lack of experience, uh, they, had, they gave me total creative freedom. Brilliant. They had maybe a couple of tracks, like one from Avatar and one from, from Moneyball, of all films. <laughs> um, but Moneyball has a great soundtrack, which is uh, it's, it's very melancholy. It, it works really well for the film. And in a strange way, this one cue worked really well for Ori. But, Really, I, I listened to them, I'm like, oh, I kind of get it, and then we threw them out pretty quickly. Yeah. <laughs> um, so in terms of tone, um, I had complete freedom. In terms of coming up with a the theme, complete freedom. They didn't really care as long as they felt that it worked. Um, and one of the luxuries I had was to be able to spend a really long time with the game. So I was familiar with the game when there was no art in the game, when, when Ori was a square, a little ge geometri geometric shape, and all of the levels were just made up of squares and triangles. Um, so I got a feel for how the game felt in the hands of the player very early on. Um, and it was only until the art came in that like, the music really started to, uh, uh, to get written at a very fast pace. Um, but having the full access to the game, every single build, uh, every single piece of concept art, every single thing that gets uploaded to Dropbox, even the failed experiments and tests, like getting to see them and seeing what someone was trying to do, um, all of that helped inform my own direction of the music. It's having access to everyone else's work helped kind of clarify in my head what I wanted to do. Um, and one thing, that also really helped with uh, from Moon Studios is that they encouraged not just me but everyone on the team to fail. Um, you, I felt like even uh, and, and this was very really helpful because I was relatively new. Yeah. Um, having a forum in which I could try stuff and it's okay to get it wrong and not be not feel like you're going to lose your job or get <laughs> reprimanded or anything like that. Um, I was able to try stuff, try it out in game, and if it doesn't work, okay, I'll just start again. Um, so the, the worst problem I ever had on, on Ori was, oh, I have to write more music, big deal. <laughs> um, so they always just said, keep plugging at it until you get it right. It's a highly, highly iterative approach. Um, a lot of game development is like that, but there was an encouragement to experiment and think outside the box as opposed to going for the safe solution. Did you get a lot of feedback? How close was your working relationship with the, the, the main producer on the project or the sound designer? Did you speak with them a lot about your music and how it's working in game? I, well, I test the game a lot myself. So if I'm, not, if I'm not happy with it myself, if it doesn't feel good to me, I'm never going to show it to, to anyone, uh, anyone. Because if, if I don't feel that it's good, how on earth can I expect anyone here or, or any of the people who I'm working with to, to think it's good? So I never submitted something until I was happy with it, until I was, getting, until I was feeling something from the game. Um, but then when I did, um, Usually, I'd only get feedback if it didn't work. If it, if, uh, if it, if it gets, the way, the way it works, we upload it into the game, and then people kind of play it and live with it. And if, if nothing comes back, that means it's, it's really good. good. Yes. <laughs> um, no, you'll never get told, you'll never get told when, it's, when it's really good. You'll only get told when it sucks. So did they, uh, did they understand music, though? Could, uh, could the producer talk to you on a technical level about music? In terms of using musical terminology? Uh, yeah. How does um, he communicate with you about his thoughts and ideas on music? He either, 
there's kind of there's, there's a technical director and there's a creative director. Thomas is the te uh, creative director, and Gennady is kind of the technical director. Um, Gennady communicates in uh, in musical terms because he he's he's a pretty capable saxophone player and he's quite good at music. Yeah. Thomas is literally the opposite. Uh, can't communicate in musical terms at all, but he can communicate emotions and feelings. So kind of between the two of them, I kind of had the best of both worlds. Um, I always lean to uh, the emotional side of things. It's much easier to figure out what's wrong and what's right when uh, emotions are being communicated. So, um, and yeah, if the emotion was being nailed, Thomas would have nothing to say. So um, it's it's very rare for him to say something is good. Um, if it's something's if he says something's good, then it actually means it's a masterpiece Amazing. and it's the greatest thing ever written. So cool. <laughs> So um, some audio directors, the way they work with uh, a music brief is they'll actually read the story. Yep. Uh, they'll see the key characters, how the relationships develop, and sort of like work out from that a list of cues that are needed for the game. How, how do you work? I think for me, the first thing I start with is looking for the character theme, but also how it relates to the overall story. Now, we're fortunate in that we had the story kind of written at least the the main pillars of the story yeah. um and you know the there's really only one main character in the game so that character needs a strong main theme and i i went through several several different versions of the the main theme um and it wasn't even me that actually found the main theme it, it was in a folder of piano experiments and someone else on the team i can't remember who it was pointed it out that like, hey, this this track, like random track four in piano experiments in the audio folder is kind of cool. Maybe you should develop it into the main theme. And then I actually expanded the sketch into something like a fully fledged piece of music. And I was like, there it is. Um, and from that, the, the rest of the score was kind of born. Um, in terms of a cue list, I kind of just went through the game based on uh, which areas of artwork had been finished first. Um, so fortunately, because of, of the way the game was developed, uh, no, everything was finished kind of uh, in order. So um, for example, our E3 demo um, was the opening 15 minutes of the game. So it was kind of cool to have the opening 15 minutes kind of set up and scored. Yeah. Um, then just like different parts of the game, different levels got filled in and I was able to kind of jump on one level at a time. As soon as the artwork got finished, then it was time for music and sound to go in and we did our stuff. Then music and sound, once we'd finished music and sound for one level, then art had finished on another level. So we were kind of always chasing tag art. Teaming. Yeah, tag teaming, yeah. yeah. Um, it was a really nice way to work. The one exception is with the cutscenes where we, um, I was given the storyboards and the storyboards had the most basic amount of information in it. But what was cool about that is I was given the storyboards and they said, write a piece of music that kind of fits this scene in terms of the timing. But if you want, we can, if you feel like a pe uh, the music needs to be extended in certain places so you can do a better build or you need to do a, um, something that will help the music become more emotional, we'll totally tweak the animation based around your music. That's very, very uncommon, I think. Normally yeah. the composer is given the scene and you will score the scene based on our timings and don't mess with it. Um, but I was, we kind of did it in reverse for, for Ori. Um, which was really nice for me because I wasn't bound to timings. Um, yeah. I could make a piece of music that I felt ebbed and flowed really well. We were also, also, by doing this, we were able to try lots of different solutions for the same scene instead of kind of being informed by the visuals only. It makes it more musical, doesn't yes. it? Yes, yeah. yeah. Uh, I think you've got some. I, I do. So um, there's two scenes. Um, we'll need to switch to, the, uh, to, the, to my computer for this. There we go. Um, so uh, this is um, two approaches for a cutscene um, that we did. Uh, it's a key cutscene in the game where the antagonist is introduced to the player for the first time. You'll also see how basic the art is uh, in early game development. Where in the middle is Ori?
Okay, so that's, that's one approach that I tried. And the feedback I got was like, okay, this, this works, but it was way, way, way too dark. And it's like, this is the evil owl. And for those of you, how many of you have played the game, by the way? Just very quick raise of hands. Okay, so those of you who have played the game know that the antagonist is not, it's not black and white. It's not, it's not she's not super, super dark and evil. Um, so here's the alternate approach. Tonally, that's slightly different, and that's kind of what we ended up going for. We wanted a little bit more mystery. And then the final version, which I'm about to show, is basically the version two, but with tweaked timing based on what I, uh, based on a few little extra things that I wanted in, in the music. So watching that um, and being a sound designer, yes. uh, I have to ask the question, how did you and the sound designer work together? How did you, when scoring a piece like that, a cutscene, uh, how did you and the sound designer decide who was going to be in charge at which moment, what was going to shine through the music or the sound effects? I mean, I mean in that scene, it sounds like the music's <laughs> kind of in charge there. Um, <laughs> So, uh, but there is one part that's noticeable where I drop out. Um, so, um, I mean, it's the introduction of the antagonist. It's the first time the player comes face to face, and it's it's a pretty epic shot visually. Yeah. Um, it's it's probably one of the iconic shots in the game, and they they really wanted to be like the this would be like the oh my goodness moment. Um, but um, it's kind of set up with the, you know, with the storm at the beginning. And so that's how the music is fairly soft until it's clear that there is serious danger. Um, so Andy and I, we, Andy's the sound designer, and we just kind of have had a telepathic communication throughout, throughout the process. I still don't know how that happened because we'd never met in person until the game was actually finished. Um, but uh, the one thing that we did talk about throughout the game is giving space for especially big punchy sound effects to shine. Um, so um, in, that, in, in, in that video, there's just a, a little part where the owl lands. And you know, if, if I go big on the music there, he doesn't have any room to do the big booming yeah. sound thing. So it's like, OK, well, I can do a big chord, and I can just drop it out. Have the owl land, and then the music. Then the owl. Then the owl is moving again, and then it kind of makes sense to have the music kind of push things <laughs> forward. Um, but with, I feel like working with any sound designer, there's always a push, pull, and ebb and flow. Um, there was never music should dominate this scene and sound should just take a back seat. It's, uh, we were always trying to get into the fine details of things where music can shine for a couple of seconds and then sound can take over, just having an interplay between the two. Did you share work in progress um, like your work in progress music for cutscenes, and did he send over his, his work in progress uh, sound effects track? I think we worked, we kind of worked in alternates basically. So I usually, because, because the cutscenes were timed to music, music was kind of the first thing that ended up yeah. getting done. But I would, the first time I did the music, I kind of wrote thinking about what Andy would do for the sound effects. I was like, well, the owl's landing, there's probably going to be a sound effect here. Yeah. Uh, so it would make sense to stay out of the way. And of course, that's kind of what he did. 
But sometimes um, there's, a, there's a scene later on in the game where it's very sound effects driven and my music is informed by what Andy does in, in the sound effects. So it's really, we would just take each scene uh, of the game on a case by case basis and see what the scene actually needs in terms of music and sound. Brilliant. As a sound designer, that's a big tick from me. <laughs> uh, so yeah, so we've talked about uh, character themes. You had an Ori theme. Mm. Uh, did you use this in variation through the game? Yeah, the Ori theme is almost in every environment in the game. There's about nine different environments in the game, and it's used pretty much everywhere in some shape or form. Uh, it's not obvious in some parts, but it's, it's hinted at throughout. Where we play the Ori theme in full is when Ori is making a big impact on the world uh, and on the, in the environment. Otherwise, it's, it's very subtle and kind of hidden. Um, but you know, the game is called Ori. You are playing yeah. <laughs> as Ori the whole time, and I just kind of want to, wanted to reinforce the theme throughout the game. So when you do hear it in full, it kind of feels like a, a hero moment. And, and a reward almost. And a reward, yes, yeah. exactly. Um, so did you have any other thematic material in there? We've talked about character themes. So uh, yeah, in the prologue, there are some additional characters in the prologue, uh, notably uh, uh, Nauru, Ori's adopted mother. And, sh and she does have a theme, but <laughs> because she's absent for most <laughs> of the game, we don't really get to use it. Except we do in the definitive edition, by the way, which has a little expansion where you can get Nauru's backstory. But uh, um, I kind of use that theme occasionally when we're dealing with anything um, to do with the uh, to do to do with loss in the game. So, for example, in in the Forlorn Ruins, um, which is where the character Gumo's uh, Gumo is this really weird spidery creature, um, who you'll see in a, another thing I'm about to show. The blue spider. Bit. Yes, um, and uh, yeah, his uh, his species um, has basically all been killed off, and that's that's another place where I kind of reuse Naru's theme to um, to show to show loss. Um, but really, we kind of stick to one theme. It's the one thing that apparently if people were bothered about it, there's only one theme in the game, but uh, it's, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's a one character game for me. So um, I chose to differentiate the music by having radically different sounds for each environment. So even though the music has an orchestra throughout the game, uh, the music in each environment should feel very different. The orchestra is the glue that holds all of that, all of the esoteric sounds together. But each environment, you should be able to listen to it and think, "Oh, that's the Ginzo tree. Oh, that's the Forlorn Ruins. Oh, that's Mount Toru." And it should it should be sonically identifiable immediately based on the instruments I've chosen. So that's how I chose to change things. That's the way you can have the same theme throughout. You can change not only the melody slightly, but also the instrumentation. You want to? Yeah, so um, there's, there's one part of the game I want to show. Um, one thing that I've always felt strongly about is having composers play, play the games that they work on. Um, and uh, this scene in particular, um, it's about six or seven pieces of music, which should all feel like one. What can sometimes happen is you get a spreadsheet of music from the audio director, and it's just like a bunch of mu music tracks that you have to write. And you can end up writing them in a vacuum. Uh, now, with this sequence, it's, uh, it's, it, if I hadn't tested it, I don't think it would have felt as continuous as, as it does. Um, and I tested the scene like crazy. This, this scene that I'm about to show, it's, it's infamous for anyone who's played the game. Um, everyone's giggling already because I think they know what it's going to be. Um, but uh, this scene we tested over and over again, and this this scene was kind of the first time that we knew exactly what the game was because it has uh, the basic gameplay, it has uh, exaggerated, like heightened gameplay, it has a cut scene, and it has the the full tension and release, um, all in about four minutes if I do it right. Awesome. <laughs> Okay, give me a sec. <sighs> Thank you. 
Okay, so I don't have time to uh, clean the corruption on both sides, so I'm just going to cheat a little bit. <laughs> and fast forward. Uh, okay. So this music that's playing in the background right now, it's, it's super, super ambient because this is a super mystical part of the game. You're in a magical tree where there's all this glowing pink stuff. It's completely, it's completely off the wall, um, and it's unlike anything that has been seen in the game before. Um, and what's about to happen is we're about to heal the tree from the corruption uh, that has been blighting it, uh, and this sets off a series of events that hopefully should all be seamless. So right now the uh, water is filling up and Ori has to escape. Okay, so uh, yeah, that's uh, that's that little sequence. Awesome. <laughs> so the reason why I, I brought that scene up, it's it's yes, it's impressive to show at a thing like this, um, <laughs> but it's it's that there's the the ambient music at the beginning, then there's a stinger that plays uh, before that chase sequence, then there's the chase sequence music itself. 
Then the cutscene on top of the Ginzo tree where the owl faces off, that's another piece of music that transitions into the fall, which is the fifth piece of music. And then finally, uh, Ori is at the bottom in the area that is clean. Um, and that's the sixth and final piece of music. And that's all uh, should feel reasonably continuous. Um, especially the last piece was where I was like, OK, we've, we've kind of got something special here, because that's the resolution of everything that's happened before. If we had another intense gameplay moment there, it would have been too much for the player. The player kind of needs uh, a reward to soak mm -hmm. in uh, to soak in everything that's just happened. It, kind of the adrenaline is still going to be flowing, especially if it's the first time you've played the game. That's the, that's the first moment of the game where all your skills as a player up until that point are truly, truly tested. Um, and you kind of need to let off steam for a bit. And it's incredibly satisfying to let off steam because it's also the first time you can swim in the game. So you've kind of got your mini Finding Nemo moment. And it's, it's really satisfying to swim because every time you go in the water before that moment, uh, it takes off one of your like health points, which is very irritating. So now you can actually <laughs> enjoy swimming. And Ori makes a cute swimming sound when he or make a cute breath sound when he comes out to breathe. So um, that whole ending is kind of like a, a mini resolution. I don't think I would have written the swamp music like that if I hadn't understood the context fully and having played it myself to understand what the player was feeling. What came before it. Yes, yeah. exactly. I think to me, when I watched that, was what I find most impressive is how seamless it seems. It seems through composed. And in fact, there's so many cues that just seamlessly go between each other. I think that's what's, to me, I found that really, really, really interesting. So how, how was that integrated? Did you have WYs, some fancy? Nothing uh, fancy. It's no? hard coded into Unity. Um, there is no. I'm hearing gasps from the audience. Always, <laughs> yeah. There is no, uh, there is no audio middleware in in Ori. Um, there's all kinds of reasons for that. Um, but we were able to make it work um, through smoke and mirrors, largely. I mean, when I, I don't do the implementation myself, but I specify exactly what I want so someone on the programming team can go and code it for me. Um, so Have you got any parameters you can tweak? So you, you yes. play a lot. Basically, yeah. basically, the only parameters I'm allowed to tweak are when things fade in, fade out, and the amount of time it takes for a, another queue to be triggered, which is just, they're all number amounts, which are very easy for me to, to tweak. But in terms of the actual code, no. They, they make an interface basically a, a, an idiot-proof interface that I can tweak uh, in <laughs> Unity. So, so all those transitions, were they crossfades, or were they actually done on beats of the music? Uh, they weren't done on beats of the music. They're just done, they're just done. It, crossfades? Yep, just done oh, on really, really short crossfades, yeah. yeah. Um, it helps when things are in the same key, obviously. But um, I use, so, so most of that music is in B minor, but when you wake up in the swamp, you're in C major. So I use the non, uh, Sorry, I use the linear music, so the cutscene music. That's when I can move to change key to make it feel different. Because um, B minor to C major is a very unnatural <laughs> transition. It doesn't doesn't work if you yeah. just put them side by side. You need time to progress through to, to modulate. Um, but I'm able to do that because I had a cutscene in which I can do whatever I want. Yeah, yeah. Um, but when make it so natural. All of the gameplay music never modulates because it's just too too dangerous to modulate, um, especially in a scene like that. Um, so that's that's how I don't get trapped by staying in the same place. And there's lots of moments like that in the game. There's lots of mini cutscenes that are like 20 seconds that allow me to kind of change direction a little bit, um, which is very helpful. And sometimes I even ask for those, look, can we have a moment where the control is taken away for the player? That's, that's really cool to um, actually be able to get those mini Yeah, any, any time when there's a stinger or something, that's like an opportunity to really change things up. Or even just a big sound effect. You know, if, uh, if, if uh, a wall collapses, obviously we're going to hear the wall. It's going to be a really big sound effect. Oh, let's, we can change the music in a subtle way here without anyone hearing the transition. <laughs> that's, we use sound effects a lot to hide any of the dodgy transitions because with no <laughs> with no middleware, there are some there are some cracks that will appear. Yeah, so sound effects are useful. They're, they're very <laughs> very useful for for composers who don't write nice transitions like me. Uh, but uh, I rem I remember even at the ending of the game, I was like. Andy, I, I need a transition here. Can we just like have a gust of wind or something? Yeah. Which no one, no one really is going to notice. So uh, just uh, just little things like that um, can make it seem more polished. I always feel like 
game development in general is the art of how well you can pull off smoke and mirrors um, to, to hide, the, hide the cracks. There's just so many cracks that you're trying to, to, to patch up. Yeah, there's um, uh, quite a lot of that is what uh, we'd probably say is horizontal interactivity. Yes. So you're using chunks and yep. adding them together to, to help make it interactive. Mm -hmm. Was there anywhere in this game that you use sort of like vertical interactivity, sort of like changing between stems? We did try it, uh, but we ended up scrapping it because it felt gimmicky. The, the, you're in and out of certain game states so quickly uh, that it, did just, it just didn't really feel right. Yeah. Um, so when you're playing the game, uh, you have the option to, to, to fight monsters, and monsters appear fairly frequently in the game. Yeah. Um, but they're also very easy to kill. So um, you don't end up being in combat for a very long time. Um, and also, the sound effects are really strong anyway. They do a great job of telling you you are fighting something. And the, yeah. the monster sound effects are quite exaggerated. They also do a great job of telling you you're in danger. If you have the music also doing that, it feels it can feel like overkill. Um, and for the gameplay music, we, we just I just ended up taking a back seat. And Andy's sound effects are really the percussion section of the music. They're very punchy and strong, but that tells the player all they need to know. But here's one other thing about the gameplay music and why we didn't really do the layered thing. Um, we didn't actually want to communicate to the player that killing everything is necessary. Killing everything in Ori is very satisfying because you can just mash X and a bunch <laughs> of fancy lights appear um, and, and it looks and feels great. But actually, we only play combat music when you have to defeat something to progress. Um, it's a subtle thing that not many people have picked up on, uh, which is fine. But it's uh, music as a game mechanic, right. basically. Um, because it is a platformer, um, and especially once you get the bash ability in the game, which is the ability to uh, to uh, change direction off either projectiles or monsters, you don't need to kill anything in the game because you can just you can just uh, you can just redirect yourself off a projectile or a monster anytime someone shoots at something at you. And you're just like, oh, I'm going to press triangle and see it off you go. Um, so you just you just don't need to fight things in the game, which is why we don't have the, the vertical layered music. We did also think about it in that chase sequence, um, but once we had the melody in there, I'm like, I don't, I don't want to mess with this because this is already already working really well as is. Yeah. So um, we did try it, but it just didn't end up making, making the cut. Um, who knows, we might try it in the second game. If, if there's an appropriate place for it, yeah. we'll do it, but if it's not appropriate, uh, I won't ever do interactivity just for the sake of putting it in. Yeah. Uh, so obviously it was an orchestral recording. Yes. Uh, I have to ask because um, it's uh, an indie game. Mm -hmm. I've worked with several composers on indie titles where we haven't had the budget to record live, uh, live orchestra. Yep. But the composers themselves have said, you know what, I really want live instruments. So they've actually footed the bill themselves. So on this game, was this something that you talked about in advance, did you always plan to use an orchestra and did they give you the budget or was it out of your own pocket? Uh, we, planned, we planned to use the orchestra from the beginning, but uh, my goodness, like we, we really pushed the Nashville musicians in terms of uh, value for money. Like <laughs> an average, so we had, we had 12 hours of uh, recording time. The score is about 140 minutes long. Uh, so to be recording, more than 12 minutes of music per hour is a pretty, it's a pretty relentless pace. Just for, just for reference, a good pace is about six to, a good fast pace is six, six to eight six. minutes of music per hour. So we were asking them to do 12, um, but needs must, you know, you just find, <laughs> you just find a way. Uh, but but uh, that, the, the chase scene music, uh, that's take two, you know, but it's, yeah. it's, I'm like, well, it's done, let's move on, uh, because we kind of had to. Um, but it was it was planned from the very beginning that we would do a live recording, and it's still amazing to me that they kind of gave me that kind of level yeah. of trust, despite my lack of experience at the time. Um, it ended up being a great decision because it did. I still remember like, I've, I've listened to the the mockups, um, and I'm like, oh, I'm glad we I'm glad we did it because yeah. it does it really does make a difference, especially in a game like this, which is dealing with. Um, you know, trying trying to convey emotions um, th throughout the game, the game experience. Um, so I'm I'm really glad that we we did it, um, 
especially on the studio's first title. Yeah. Do you have a team of people you work with? Do you have a go-to orchestrator, a go-to conductor, a go-to engineer for these things? Well, here's the funny thing about this, is because we, uh, because we spent all the money on the orchestra, we didn't really have money for orchestration um, or, or the music preparation. So I actually did all of that myself. Wow. Um, but, uh, and I regret it, because um, <laughs> I did not get any sleep. Uh, but um, I do have uh, two core team members, uh, Alex, Alex Rudd, who is my conductor, um, and Zach Lemon, who's kind of, he's now, he now does orchestration for me, but at the time he's just kind of my second pair of ears because he hears things the same way as I do. Um, and those two have been with me on every single recording since Ori, but we also went to school together at the University of Southern California. So we've known each other for nine years. Um, and it's just kind of cool that we've, been, you know, we've been able to work together on everything since. It's, it's much easier to work with your friends. And one thing I've noticed that the, the orchestra could picks up on the good chemistry between us. And when the orchestra knows that we're having a good time, they end up having a good time too, which means they end up playing, they end, they, there's just like, they end up giving a little bit extra for you. And that also came across in the recordings for this. Um, so you don't conduct it? I don't conduct uh, because a lot of my music has pre-recorded elements. Um, it's not all orchestra in the room. It's orchestra in the room combined with a bunch of stuff. There's a lot of synth work in Ori, which is kind of not really at the forefront, but it's there. And I kind of need to hear the, the final result. Um, plus, Alex, my conductor, is, is absolutely brilliant. Um, and when I'm figuring out what to do next, he's telling uh, another 10 jokes to the orchestra um, because that's what he's really good at. So uh, he keeps the players engaged um, yeah. while I'm trying to figure out what to do next. He's, yeah. I, I'm kind of the bad cop and he's the good cop. So <laughs> it works I really still well. can't get over the 12 minutes. I mean, the, the level of musicianship there must have been well, crazy to, it's to funny. do it that when, fast. When, when I told Microsoft and Moon that I was going to Nashville, of course, the natural reaction is, why are you recording our emotional fantasy score in Nashville, the city of banjos and country yeah. music? <laughs> uh, but the funny thing is, is uh, what most people don't know, that Nashville Symphony Orchestra has won a Grammy for best classical recording in the past. Um, and the level of musicianship, it's not just country music in Nashville. They're recording Christian rock. They're recording orchestral albums. They're recording rock music, pop music, so that all the players are capable of playing in literally any style that you put in front of them. So uh, having a score like Ori is really nothing new to them. And because they are brilliant sight readers, um, they, they take one is, is usable, and take two is really, really, really excellent. Yeah. Um, so um, it. It, it definitely was a fast pace and we were strapped for time, but we, we evidently got it all finished. So, uh, um, but I would never work at that pace again. <laughs> uh, so have you, I've got to ask the question, yes. have you ever recorded in any of the London studios? Uh, yes, last year I recorded Ark Survival Evolved um, at, at Abbey Road Studios. Uh, and that was with a 93 piece orchestra, which is by far That's the biggest huge. group uh, I've uh, ever worked with. Um, I mean, it's an appropriate sized orchestra for a game uh, about dinosaurs. Um, this is which epic. It's, it's, <laughs> it's beyond epic. And, and if any, anyone who's played the game knows that it, is, it gets super ridiculous by the time you get to the late levels. You have, you have Iron Man level powers. Your dinosaurs can, can, sh can, can shoot lasers from their eyes and all, <laughs> all kinds of weird things. So, so what was the split of that 1993 piece? Uh, 50 strings, um, triple wood wind. Um, the brass section was four trumpets, uh, six French horns, uh, one tennis trombone, two bass trombones, a contrabass trombone, which is a real luxury, uh, one cimbasso, one tuba, uh, and four percussionists. I think that makes 93. Wow. It's, uh, so to compare that next to Ori, what was the Ori setup like? <laughs> so 75% uh, of the score for Ori is done with 22 <laughs> strings, uh, flute, oboe, and clarinet, yeah. uh, and piano. And the remaining 20% is done with 30 strings, uh, four horns, three trombones, and double woodwind. So the, so the large section is about 50 players, and the, the regular section is 25. Cool. Um, so, which worked for the game. I think actually like the chamber sized orchestra really worked for kind of the intimate, intimate setting. There's something, when you have a big string section, uh, some of the intimacy gets lost um, because it's this big mass of sound. But when you have 
22 players in the string section, uh, you can kind of really hear the rosin on the bow when, when a violinist is playing, as opposed to 50, you're not gonna hear that. You're not gonna hear the real detail, yeah. um, but that real detail kind of brings you a little bit closer to the characters. Um, at least that's what it sounded like to me. Yeah, actually I'm just gonna pop to a, cu a couple of people uh, sent me questions okay. before the event. Uh, some of the, I think we might have answered a couple of them. There we go, this one's from Michael Leaning, a sound designer, Shotgun Mike Audio. Uh, as a sound designer who works in different kinds of visual media, virtually all of them with music, I always try to take into consideration what's going on in the music when designing assets of, or soundscapes. What do you do as a composer when considering the sounds that will play alongside your score? Yeah, I mean, it's one of the, I, I think, uh, I'm, I'm lucky in that I have very easy access to the sound designers who I work with. I'm, I kind of make a point of reaching out to them uh, wherever, wherever possible. Um, and if I'm able to talk to them about the scene beforehand, and then then I'll discuss um, discuss what it's needed. But if I'm not able to get a hold of them, I'm just going to look at the scene myself and uh, you know turn any music off um, and think what are the big sound effect moments here that I might have to possibly write around. It's quite easy to write around a sound effect uh, once you've once you're able to plan for it and, and set everything up in terms of the timing and getting the right tempo for the music. Um, so it just it just requires a, a thought process, but I'm I'm always thinking about what is the sound doing here. Um, and in the case of Ori, a good example is with the sound effects being the percussion. Once I'd established that, I'm like, well, I don't need to use any percussion instruments before. That's one section of the orchestra wiped out. I yeah. don't even need to worry about it, um, yeah. which you know made my life a little bit easier. I have to ask, and, and although this obviously didn't happen on Ori, yep. but on other titles that you've worked on, yes. have you ever handed your music over to somebody? else to implement? Uh, yes, so on the Unspoken, which is a virtual reality title uh, by Insomniac Games, uh, yeah. it's, uh, it's, it's a game where you are a wizard and you can cast magic spells in VR with your hands, which is really, really awesome. Um, it's kind of like Mortal Kombat, but for wizards. Uh, <laughs> um, so uh, yeah, for that game, I was asked to write within a specific system, a specific music system that the, the uh, audio lead had designed. Yep. Um, and we didn't know if it would work, but it looked like it would work. And he just said, we need, we need an ambient cue, we need uh, a regular battle cue, we need an escalated battle cue, and we need transitions to go from each each ambient, from ambient to battle, from battle to escalator, uh, and then there's a, a boss queue uh, as well, uh, and it all needs to Was that to in WYs? Or yes, that was yeah, all in WYs, yeah. but I never had any, any contact with the, the WYs uh, middleware. I literally just handed over the audio files, made sure that they looped correctly, um, and just handed them over, and they would come back to me, and I would listen to it and be like, hey, that's great. Uh, yeah. That's the way I prefer to work. So um, obviously, you were heavily involved with Ori. Yeah. Uh, this one, obviously, for the implementation side, yep. not. So, But did you still get really involved in actually playing the game and giving feedback? Because you said that as you played Ori, you, you might change the cues <laughs> because you've actually heard it. Yeah. Um, with, uh, with the Unspoken, uh, because because it was an Oculus Touch title, it was a launch title for Oculus Touch, there's uh, security issues about uh, about getting access to a, right, to a okay. dev filter. But I live in LA and Insomniac Games are in LA too, so I was just able to go over there and play the game myself. Um, and uh, later on, they would just send tons and tons and tons of video. So anyone who's working in games as a composer now, if you if for whatever reason you can't play the game, and there, there are valid security reasons for not being able to get hold of a build uh, of the game, uh, get them to send you video or ask to go to the studio to play the game, uh, either one or the other, um, because it's, it's immensely helpful. Um, we did do a single player expansion for, for The Unspoken, and they literally just recorded the entire game from start to finish, four hours of it. Wow. And I was like, it felt like scoring a movie, <laughs> to be honest, and, and it was great fun. It was just, I was scoring a movie kind of in chunks and making sure the correct parts looped. Um, and they had all of the cues laid out for me for which parts needed to be looped and which parts needed to be transitions. Um, so it was really, really easy to work with, but it's, it's just kind of nice when you can hand stuff over and it's uh, implemented for yeah. you. Yeah, so, so that was a VR title. Yes. Did that change the way you thought about the, how the music was going to be in the game? Did it change the way you thought you were gonna mix the music or where you thought uh, 
I mean, was it up to you if the music was just stereo at the front, whether it was all around you? I Did think you? the one thing, it was interesting because we, the multiplayer component of the game came out at the end of 2016. The yeah. single player component of the game came out in 2017. And there was defin a definite progression in the music based on what I learned from the first time around. So one thing I found about the sound in the multiplayer game, it's, it's very transient heavy. There's a, lot of, there's a lot of high frequency punchy sounds. And I, was, and I recorded a live drum kit for, for, the, for the multiplayer. And it sounds awesome. Um, but I realized pretty quickly that I had to like cut off all of the high end stuff from the, from the drum kit. And so for the single player, there's hardly any percussion. It's certainly not on the high end. There's no cymbals, there's no, there's no clicky percussion. There's, yeah. a lot of, there's a lot of bass kicks, because they don't really get in the way as much. Yeah. Um, but it was one of those things where I learned a lot just from, uh, just from having experienced the game and, having, and, and now having another kind of- Just had, from listening just to from, it. Just from listening to it. Um, but I, I think I would not have expected the sound to be quite as detailed because, because it is coming from you in all directions. Um, the game- um, Was it mixed to be surround? Uh, I, I wouldn't, it, it feels like it's a surround game just because you can teleport anywhere on the, on the, on the battlefield. Um, like one of the main mechanics of the game is you can teleport. So you, if I'm here right now, I can just use the teleport spell to be right behind you and then can cast a spell from behind yeah. you. So obviously you can hear that. Um, Whereas in a game like Mortal Kombat, it's kind of like left to right, so you kind of know where things are going to occur on the stereo yeah. field. But with VR, you have you, you don't well, it's, you have a lot more options. And I would have probably made the music less busy um, on a second go around. It's not it still works, but in, in the single player, um, I'm able to uh, rectify that by making the music a little bit less busy, and thus the sound effects still have their time to shine, yeah. but the music still has the driving momentum. Um, it was just. It just felt like because the the sound field was bigger that there was a lot more going on. Because you've uh, worked on Ark uh, Survival Evolved. Evolved. Yes. And uh, that is that was early access, wasn't it? Yes. So how was that for you? Because obviously people could give you feedback on your own music. <laughs> oh boy. Um, <laughs> So yeah, the, my favorite story with that is with, with, the, with the main theme. Um, so the main theme for Ark was literally the first piece of music that I wrote for the game. Uh, and it ended up staying in. I, it didn't even get to a version two. It's extremely rare for, for, for a version one to get approved, yeah. uh, especially for something as important as the main theme. Um, but they ended up putting it in the trailer and it's this rousing piece of music that is a call to action and it's, and it's tied up with a montage of dinosaurs and humans doing all kinds of crazy things. It, yeah. it is absolutely wild. Um, and it got a lot of people interested in the game. And I dared to tweak the main theme and <laughs> I did, but tweaking, I mean like subtle EQ things and, uh, and production techniques that I did not think the public would notice. Mm -hmm. And eventually we recorded the theme with, uh, with the orchestra at Abbey Road. And uh, I remember when we put it in as an, as an update and uh, it's literally the same notes <laughs> as the very first version. I did not change a thing. And quote, they've ruined the music. <laughs> <laughs> And I'm like, N no, I haven't really. But it's it's really just an adjustment period. Um, the the people who had been playing the game and living with it for, at that point, two years, yeah. have become so used to hearing the main theme in a certain format, and thus they become attached to it. And then there's a nostalgic element. If you start screwing with people's memories, so you weren't tempted to hook it out and go, no panic. Uh, no, I, I mean, we, we, we left it in there. Um, but it was kind of tempting for me to like leave an option where you like legacy music. Like, so yeah. if, if, you, if you want to hear the old menu music, <laughs> you have that option. Um, but, but people, people adapted to it. People, yeah. it's, it's like when, whenever Facebook or the BBC do a website revamp, Everyone is really annoyed by it because they have to find they have to everything's in a slightly different yeah. place. But then we all adapt because it's human nature, yeah. um, and then everything's fine. Yeah. Um, but I remember that the heat. 
the heat after after we changed, and it wasn't just the main theme. It was you know it was all the combat music. It all got it all got re-recorded. Yeah. Um, the, the heat uh, was was quite astonishing. Um, it was it was a very unique thing for me because it's not unusual for a director to fall in love with a piece of temp music, but in this case, my music is the temp music, and I want to replace it. Yeah, yeah. But I'm not allowed to. No. Um, <laughs> so it was a, it was a, there was a, that was a new experience for me that I've never had in games before. Um, and I think I think just now it's just one of those things that I would accept moving forward. You know, the, there's there's always going to be an adjustment period in, yeah. in an early access title, um, but um, without the early access, we wouldn't have been able to record at Abbey Road in the first place because Arc sold a lot of units, yeah. um, which allowed us to re to do that big recording. So it's you you've, you kind of take the rough with the smooth. Cool. I don't know if you want to uh, play a bit. Of uh, arc? the arc, arc main theme, yes, and I'm not going to play you the original thing that I wrote. You're going <laughs> to you're going to get the version that I like. <sighs> okay, so this is the this is the main theme. Nice, quiet, subtle piece of music. Thank you. So are we going to questions in a minute? OK. I've just got one more question, okay. uh, which I just want to ask because they put it in before the event. So okay. I feel I need to say it. Uh, so this is from Elliot Daniels, a composer at Penworks Media. He says, is your approach to storytelling for video games different to how you might approach storytelling in film? And what are those differences, if any? <laughs> I mean, the, the obvious main point to start with is with, with film, you're going from A to B, and there's, there's, a, fixed, there's a fixed way you're going to do it. It's going to be the same. Whenever you watch a film, it's the same way every time. Whenever you're playing any narrative game, it's going to be slightly different, and that's, that's what you've got to take into consideration when, whenever doing a game. As for how I approach it, I still feel like I approach it with the same mindset that I have doing a film. I want to get... I want to get the key dramatic and emotional moments absolutely right. Um, with the parts where you're dealing with looping music, 
that's where that's the big difference between you, you'll never have looping music in yeah, film. No. Um, so that's the part where it really is very different. That's where you've got to keep the player immersed and you've got to keep them engaged in the world. You've got to write a piece of music which, is, which they can listen to for five to 10 minutes, potentially, yeah. that doesn't annoy them, but also <laughs> does enough to keep them engaged in the world. Uh, and that, is, that, for me, is the most fun challenge of, of game music is how do you keep the player immersed for long periods of time, but also uh, but also not annoy the hell out of them? Yeah. Um, that's the biggest challenge. See, whereas a film, you, you're never going to run into that problem because yeah. uh, you know you, you're never going to have to loop music. Um, so that, that that there's not really a different approach. It's more just like um, there's different problems to yeah. solve. Also, your music's always going to be there in in a film. Yep. Your music it's baked in, whereas in a game people can turn off your music as well. Yes, they so can. So you've got to keep them interested, yes. or else they'll just fade that yes, right down. Yes, exactly. Yeah, uh, it's, yeah that, it's funny, like when, it, you know, that we, every game has to have the music slider, and I'm just like, don't touch it. Um, <laughs> but, uh, um, but you've got, it's, it's on the composer to make sure that they don't re even consider reaching for that music slider, and that, that means not, com you know, that means composing something that's not Annoying. Although what's funny is, you know, that that arc theme. It's really, it's kind of obnoxiously loud, <laughs> um, and it's the first thing you hear on the on the main menu. And it's it's kind of a running gag now about how loud the music is on the main menu. <laughs> um, but people never change the volume slider because it also is the call to action. So um, it's gets one them of, in the mood. The, yeah, it gets them in the mood exactly. I feel like. Game music, it has to get you, it has to get you in the mood and ready to play. You have to be, it has to get you into that zone where you're where you're ready to play a game. Yeah. Um, if I feel like when I'm really immersed in a game, there's like nothing that can take me out of it. Um, in the case of Ori, one of the one of the best decisions we made was to have no loading screens. Um, and I've I've seen people play the game for the first time that like oh, I hate platformers I don't want to play this oh, platformers suck mm -hmm. um, and then I just shut up here's the control um, and and then they play for like three and a half hours because they don't know where to stop you have yeah. to willingly want to <laughs> stop which means pressing start and finding the pause menu and yeah. that's the only time when the music actually actually stops yeah. playing um, and so. It means we've done a good job with keeping the player engaged and immersed, but that is a really, really, that's one of the most enjoyable challenges for me is like how long, I always find it like a personal challenge, how long can I keep the player in this game so that they don't even have to go and eat? <laughs> <laughs> cool, I think we're going to go to some questions in the audience now, if anybody has one. So we'll go to that chap over there. Gareth, thank you so much for an enlightening thing. I, I sort of recognised the power of music in games when I played the, the original Medal of Honor on PlayStation, which was great. I'm just curious to know, in terms of your evolution as a composer with games, what would you say is your, the biggest thing you've learned and what are the things that you still struggle with when you're trying to work with a game? Uh, I'll start with what I struggle with. Uh, I'm still a control freak. Uh, I do. I still do too much work myself, um, and uh, I I have been very slow to learn to give work to trusted advisors. Um, with Ori, because I did everything myself, and it's kind of like it's kind of like my my first baby. You know, I didn't I didn't want no one touch it. Um, but gradually, I've I've learned. Like in the case of Ark. It's physically impossible for me to orchestrate like 150 minutes of music for 93 players, um, and I, I, I wanted to do it myself, but I was. I, it got to the point where I was like, "Why am I doing this myself? Why am I doing a 15th piece of battle music, which I, I've already done 14? Why don't I show an orchestrator my template for how to get it done, and they can do the remaining tracks?" So, so delegation is something I still struggle with. Um, even though even though I do have trusted advisors and friends that would easily s step in and, and help me out with it um, and yeah I guess the thing that I've um, I've learned the the most um, and I, I, I mentioned it um, at the beginning I've, I've I've become even more willing to to fail and experiment uh, but I've also been very lucky 
that I've had developers who have allowed me to do that. Um, if there are any developers here in the room, please encourage your, uh, your composers and your artists and your animators to, to, to fail and experiment and try to come up with something new because you might end up with something that you never heard before. Um, and it's something I'm now more, more willing to do than ever before. Um, and it, I used to be scared of doing that because when, you, when, you, when you've been told that you failed, you feel like you might lose your job. And especially when you're at the beginning of your career, you, that's the last thing you actually want. Um, but, but now, having done that several times, it's become easier and easier. Who's next? <laughs> hey, um, so I think you said in the past that you started out doing like more electronic stuff. Yes. Um, and then getting into uh, into games, you kind of yep. ended up with this kind of like orchestral yep. uh, identity. Um, how do you feel about that? <laughs> and do you feel like you've been kind of like sent down this rabbit hole that you? Well, I'm pretty gonna get out of. I mean, I did. I've always enjoyed doing electronic music. My score for the my score for the Unspoken is entirely electronic. Um, it's it's basically a mix of electronic and rock music. Um, so I did get to finally revisit that. Um, but if you flash back to the beginning of this talk where I played the track that got me the Ori gig, it's not orchestral. Um, it's very, very ambient, um, and it's very electronic. There's, it's, it's, it's organic ambient music. The, the sounds are rooted in the real world, but they're heavily treated. Um, so I'm classically trained. I went to the Royal Academy of Music, um, and I went to the University of Southern California, both really, really good sc schools for learning traditional music. But I've always had a love for, for electronic music um, since I, I can't remember when it started. Um, but there are production techniques in electronic music that transfer really, really well over to producing film music um, and vice versa. Um, uh, so I kind of just feel like the two worlds intertwine for me. Um, me ending up doing orchestral music, I mean, it's just what happened because of Ori. Like, if, you know, Ori came out we used an orchestra, I'm probably going to get to do more orchestral music. But that's why it was a real surprise when Insomniac Games picked me to do the Unspoken. Uh, I'm convinced they did a blind audition, because I think if they'd seen, if they'd seen my name next to the thing, they'd be like, why, are we, why is the Ori composer submitting something for this? Um, and uh, they liked the attitude that my, my, pitch, my pitch had. And so I, so I got to do two and a half hours of electronic rock music, which was, which was really awesome. So, I feel very fortunate that I haven't quite been pigeonholed yet. But if I'm going to be pigeonholed, there's worse things to be pigeonholed than doing uh, the kind of music that I do for, for Ori. I, I do find it interesting, actually, that you're still pitching. Do you know what I mean? Because after all the awards that Ori got, you know, you'd assume, if you didn't know the industry, that that's just like a... I am Gareth Cochran. I want to work on your if game. Only, <laughs> if only it was that simple. Uh, sa uh, sadly, it isn't. I mean, I have, I have, been go I have gotten gigs without pitching, but, but generally speaking, I mean, I don't mind pitching. It's, it's, it's fine. It's, no, you it's have kind to, of a, you? you have to. Yep. Yeah. So. Another question? Uh, my question pertains to your time um, before you started college. Because um, as I understand, before you had entered college, you were very much just a pianist, and you focused on mel or melodic writing and whatnot. And I'm sure it was around that point that you realized that you had to do mixing and mastering um, to, to enter that career. Um, I just want to know, what did you do to help yourself catch up on those things? Yeah, so um, I remember when, when I applied to the Royal Academy of Music, I remember my, my portfolio. Uh, I, I'm still not sure why they accepted me, because there was, there was literally one piece of orchestral music in there. And it was, it was barely an orchestral piece of music. Um, it was mostly piano stuff. but. Uh, the reason they picked me is because of my melodic writing. And they said, everything else you can learn. Um, and so all of the orchestration stuff, we had orchestration classes at the academy, um, but 
um, what I really learned while I was there um, was from going to the practice rooms and harassing the students and telling me to teach them about their instrument. Um, and you know, they were more than willing to do so because it broke up the monotony of their practice. So that's where I learned the orchestration. In terms of mixing and mastering, that comes back to the electronic music, um, actually. Um, so, uh, and it also comes down to, to listening. I listen to a lot of music, and by listening, I don't mean having it on in the car or having it on in the kitchen while you cook or just having it on in the background. That's passive listening. I think passive listening is terrible. Um, I, if, especially if you're a composer, you should be actively listening to you know at least one album of music a week, if not more, and trying to break you know try and break down a track and try and learn what makes it good or, or not what makes it good, but why do you like it? Um, try and break it down, and that's honestly how I learned uh, mixing and mastering. I would take a track by someone else, bring it into my software, and try and recreate it. Um, and I would just try and get as close as I can. Um, and by that, you're not only you're learning all kinds of technical skills, but you're also training your ears as well. And training your ears is a lifetime study. Um, so there's no excuse to ever stop doing that. Um, so you're, you're always constantly learning. So I'm always trying to constantly actively listen. Uh do you have any advice about the pitching process? Like, do you make new tracks for that, or do you use stuff that you've done in the past? Or it depends on uh, it depends on how much time I have. Um, some pitches, they're just like, yeah, can you put something together in two days? Um, then I'll try and compose something, one thing original, and then uh, you know, f try and find similar tracks in my library like it. Um, but if I have a week or two, um, then I'll usually try and do a, a minimum of three tracks. But a lot of pitches in games now actually have very specific briefs, which actually is really helpful. Um, usually they'll want an ambient piece of music, they'll want a combat piece of music, and they'll want to show, they'll want to see how you're going to transition from one to the other. And often they'll want like a, a high concept track, like nothing that really ties into gameplay, but like. What do you write a piece of music that you feel this game represents based on what we've told you? Um, there's no real secret to pitching other than whatever you are pitching, uh, don't cheat on it. Uh, make sure it sounds like the final product. That's probably going to cost you money, um, and that part sucks. I've I had uh, a run in uh, 26 through 2016 through 2017 where I lost four pitches in a row and spent a decent amount of money on it. But uh, at the end of the day, even if you lose the pitch, you've still got a finished piece of music that is really high quality that you could probably use somewhere else or sell somewhere else. So uh, there's no real loss to it. It just can hurt at the time if you, if you lose. Um, but it's the nat composers far, far more famous than me lose pitches all the time uh, and far, far bigger than me lose pitches all the time. So do, like, it's normal to lose pitches. You will lose far more than you win. Um, so uh, my only advice on pitching is just to do the absolute best job you possibly can with the resources that you have. This is the final question. Oh my goodness. Gosh, that's pressure. Uh, thank you very much. Um, you. With regards to the, again, with the pitching, yes. as uh, I write mainly concert music, but also I pitch for ads, so I'm used to pitching for ads. But I very much like the idea of getting into games. Where where do I get to pitch? Where do you get to pitch? Yeah, so how do I find out? Uh, I mean, in my case, my agent just sends me the stuff and I respond. Um, but but generally, if you, if you are looking for opportunities to pitch, you kind of need to go to the places where people are making games. So if if I want to get more work, I'm I'm going to go to the Game Developers Conference. I'm going to go to PAX. I'm going to go to E3. I'm going to go to Gamescom. I'm going to go to Develop. There's there are so many places where game developers are congregating, but I'm not going to aggressively advertise my service. I'm just going to make myself known and appear on the scene. And if people, you know, if if I build up a rapport with someone, then that's great. But I try not to. I try not to force myself onto people because ultimately I want people to discover me through my work, um, and that's 
so a couple of the pictures I've gotten have be solely because people played Ori and thought, oh, I wonder if we could hire uh, the Ori composer on our project. Maybe he's a good fit. Let's have him try something. Um, so in, in many ways, I think the, the way to get more pitches is to do more work. But of course, to do more work, you might need to win more pitches. So it's kind of a chicken and egg thing. Um, but you, there's all, you, don't need the, you don't need necessarily to have a pitch to write more music. Um, I was saying earlier um, to some, some, some composers, uh, there is no excuse for a composer not to be writing music every single day of their life if they, if they want to. Um, the only person stopping me from writing music is myself. Um, even if I'm not scoring a game or scoring a film, there is always uh, someone that needs music somewhere, so I should be writing something every single day. Um, and if you're writing something every single day, that means you have something new to put out into the world which potentially someone could listen to. Did you ever go down the library route at any time? Have you ever done I still am going game? down the library, mu uh, library music route. Um, and yeah, I've been building, building library music a catalog for five or six years now, um, which is uh, making life a, a lot easier. But it's something you really have to persevere with. Um, you, you can't kind of do it half-heartedly because you need a huge amount of music to make a decent amount of income to ha have library music make a significant difference. But that's just another revenue stream for a composer. Most of us like to sit in our ivory towers and think, yes, I'll score games the rest of my life, but what are you mm -hmm. going to do when no game comes along for a year or two? You've yeah. kind of got to do something else. Uh, fortunately, library music is a, is a good avenue for that. Yeah. Uh, so I'd like to say a massive thank you for Gareth for coming today. Uh, I would also like to say a massive thank you for you guys coming along to support game events at BAFTA. Once again, a huge thank you to the uh, BAFTA uh, partners, uh, Activision, Blizzard, EA, PlayFusion, Sega, Tencent Games and Ubisoft. And finally, uh, just a bit of a promotion for the BAFTA Crew Games. Uh, earlier today, uh, BAFTA Crew Games uh, got to meet with Gareth for a private roundtable event. Uh, so if any of you would like to know more about BAFTA Crew Games, if you visit guru.bafta.org forward slash opportunities to find out more, uh, I'd say get in there quick because the deadline for this lot of applications closes on the 23rd of April. So uh, with that, with that, thank with that you we much. should thank Adele for doing a great job oh, hosting. No. <laughs> Adele, Adele. Cheers, thanks very much. Okay.